On the morning of January 27th, 2021, a French Canadian man prepared for the day with his usual routine consisting of a morning workout, shower, and a cup of black coffee. In the years leading up to today, he would usually grab a briefcase and head to the office where he worked, providing IT support for his fellow Canadian government employees. Instead, due to the pandemic, he headed upstairs to his home office where a computer awaited him with six monitors and two keyboards. But today, there was something very different. Noises outside, shouting, car door slamming, a loud commotion for a quiet suburb in Quebec. As Sebastian looked out of the window, searching for the source of the disturbance, it all became quite clear. There, approaching his house like a swarm of tactically geared ants, were the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. They were coming to raid his house again, but this time, this time, it would be the last. Hi, your files are encrypted by Netwalker. If for some reason you read this text before the encryption ended, this can be understood by the fact that the computer slows down and your heart rate has increased due to the ability to turn it off, then we recommend that you move away from the computer and accept that you have been compromised. In the year 2021, according to statistics, 20% of all cybercrimes were attributed to what we call ransomware. That is 623.3 million ransomware attacks per year distributed across the globe, targeting both individuals and businesses, regardless of size or importance. Ransomware refers to a malicious software that blocks access to a computer system, usually demanding a payment in Bitcoin or otherwise easily transferred digital currency to then unlock the system. Essentially, somebody gains access to your computer and restricts access to your files, often then combing through them for anything they can use to blackmail you with, and then offers you the opportunity to pay them for the trouble of not exposing that to the public. These leaks are often posted to the dark web, sometimes bundled up as sales of data, often posted publicly just to punish those who would refuse to pay up. You might then ask why? Why would they still post the information if there's nothing to be gained personally by the hackers? The answer is to scare future victims. If word got out that the threats of exposure were toothless, people would simply ignore the threats, have their hard drives reformatted, rebuild their system, and declare the restricted files as lost forever. An inconvenience, but nothing too major. But if there was a certainty that banking documents, pictures, identity, credit card numbers, and any other number of secrets kept on that hard drive would make their way to the hands of the shady underground internet referred to as the dark web, well, suddenly paying becomes much more attractive as a concept. After all, this would open them up to any number of other potential crimes, and that goes just for individuals, for businesses, well, it's both more complicated as well as simpler. Now it's not just damages to themselves they need to worry about, but to that of their clients, partners, shareholders, and more. Still, looking at the statistics, only around 10% of ransomware victims actually send a payment to unlock their files and to prevent them being posted. But 10% of hundreds of millions of attacks is still a substantial amount, resulting in ransomware being a multi-billion dollar business year on year. One of the most lucrative industries on the planet for cost versus profit. And of course, of those 10% who pay, it heavily skews towards companies due to their willingness to trade short-term capital to avoid long-term damage. Realistically, this becomes a business decision. If a company refuses a few hundred thousand dollar ransom, it can result in the loss of millions of dollars in restoring their lost service and data, let alone the reputational cost. So now you know the business of ransomware, but what does an attacker usually look like? If you picture this in your head right now, you will probably come up with a foreign national who is far removed from the consequences of such cybercrime. Maybe they're sitting in a hoodie in a dark room. The reality, however, is that the business of ransomware has been increasingly operating like a real company now for many years. 
They have customer support representatives all over the world for different languages. They have regular office jobs during the day to hide their activities by night. They can be your average everyday person, your boss, your brother, your coworker, your neighbor. And that's what makes the dark web and modern day crime completely unpredictable. It's right there in plain sight and it's easily accessible. Which is why in 2021, 66% of organizations reported being affected by ransomware in some way, which was an increase of 78% compared to 2020. An insane number that's only getting bigger as time goes on. So what about how a ransomware attack happens? What does it look like? Well, this is what it looks like from a cybersecurity expert's perspective. In August 2020, Arthur keeps sat in his home office in Vancouver. Arthur worked for a large real estate developer called Amacon. He was handling an email from a co-worker who was having trouble opening a network file. Luckily, Arthur managed to gain access to the system after using alternative methods, only to realize that the files on the system had been altered from dot doc to random garbage. He quickly realized somebody had been in the system, and now, when the files were opened, he instead opened a message from the hacker that read exactly what you heard at the beginning of this video. Hi, your files are encrypted by Netwalker. At this point, the options for most people are very simple. You're faced with two of them, and this is how they play out. Option one, you follow the link provided, which takes you to a chat program on a dark web portal that was specifically designed to facilitate negotiations for payment. They tell you how much they want, you haggle, and then you pay the money to a Bitcoin address, at which point they unlock your files and wish you a pleasant day. After all, for them, this is simply business, no hard feelings. Option number two, you don't click the link, you don't negotiate, negotiations fail, or some other conclusion that results in the ransom not being paid. If you're an individual, your information is then posted online and you now run the risk of a whole number of other potential crimes, cyber stalking, harassment from other scammers, who now have partial or full access to a whole dump of information about you, potentially your family. And if you're a business, well, you are now locked out of a bunch of files that you better have a backup for, your systems need to be rebuilt, anything tied to your network no longer works, and you might be out for the count for days, weeks, or months, depending on how centralized you kept things. You've also lost the respect, trust, and potential business of your customers, and could quite literally go bust due to the combination of events. That's why for businesses, this comes down to a simple game of numbers. What would it cost to comply versus what would it cost to ignore? To pay up might cost them 1% of their yearly revenue, but to lose access to their files could cost them everything. For Arthur and Amicon, they didn't pay. Instead, they relied on his expertise and safeguards to restore their data in a timely manner and continue as if nothing had happened. Within 72 hours, due to his precautions and knowledge, they were back up and running. No harm, no foul. Amicon, though, is the exception here. They are an outlier who were lucky to have Arthur in his preparation. Most companies spend close to zero dollars on cybersecurity, and even when they do, the damages often transcend that of finances. What does that sentence mean? Well, if you look at the stats, one of the industries impacted most by ransomware is the health industry, which can mean delays in diagnosis and treatment of critically unwell patients, which means that there's not just dollar value damages due to ransomware, but actual human life and risks of societal or civil unrest. A clear example of this is the Sick Kids Hospital in Toronto, who lost access to most of their systems, phone lines, imaging results, and more for multiple months, crippling their ability to provide care to sick children. This is one example, and the numbers speak for themselves of the scope. In 2021, just the US health industry was hit by $7.8 billion in damages in downtime alone. Ransomware has become the boogeyman of modern cybercrime. And why? Because where it previously was individuals throwing out a little net hoping to catch a couple small fishes, the industry has been taken over by Amazon, Coca-Cola, Walmart, Microsoft, and more. No, not those actual companies, just the scale of them. There are now businesses that are treating ransomware as a service. They have elevated what was a disorganized and niche crime into something far scarier and far larger. They've built tools, training, infrastructure, and they've recruited talented individuals. And in 2020, 
They found their most valuable asset to date, Sebastian. Sebastian seemed, on surface level, a normal guy, respectable, in good shape, and of course trustworthy. That is, if you didn't know his history, which it seemed nobody did. In 2015, at the age of 27, Sebastian was charged with seven counts of possession for the purpose of trafficking drugs. In his house, they found a locked room that contained 45 kilograms of marijuana, 60,000 methamphetamine tablets, 8,600 grams of hash, 13,000 ecstasy pills, and a money counting machine. Somehow, this treasure trove of illegal substances and evidence of his dealing going back to 2012 or earlier only netted Sebastian three and a half years behind bars, of which he only served a handful of months. Somehow, even more bizarrely, this federal conviction didn't disqualify Sebastian for the job he gained in the Canadian government. Just one year later in 2016, Sebastian was in gainful employment as an IT specialist for the Canadian Public Services. Now did prison and a government job stop the otherwise normal guy from his life of crime? No, of course not. During the day, Sebastian went to the office and performed his IT responsibilities, and during the evening, he continued to traffic narcotics. That is, until he was caught yet again in 2019. Despite that, he still didn't stop. He seemed determined to live a double life. One as a white collar worker who no one would ever consider could be up to anything nefarious, and the other as a dark web crime kingpin. There was one lesson he did learn though, and that was to put the physical act of hoarding narcotics behind him, instead answering an ad on the dark web that asked, do you want to participate in ransomware attacks? To which he typed, yes. Over the next months, Sebastian worked with Netwalker to learn the tools of the trade, how to use their software, who to use it on, what to say when it worked, what to say when it didn't. You see, Netwalker was a serious organization. They had protocols, support staff, hierarchy of management, training, and of course guidelines. This wasn't some basement operation where anything goes, you have to comply with their rules. The most important of which was who exactly could become their victims. Netwalker specifically focused on business instead of chaos. They didn't want to cast a wide net, risking exposure or capture for a very small percentage payout from individuals or small businesses. Instead, they set sights on companies with a specific dollar value of yearly revenue. If a company didn't turn over more than $30 million per year in revenue, they were off the hook and ignored, even if access was guaranteed. Netwalker was not participating in ransomware to steal secrets or publish information for fun. They did this purely to make money, just like every other business on the planet, though of course blatantly more illegal. So why 30 million? Why that number? Well, they also had another rule. The initial ask for ransom would amount to 1% of the total revenue, meaning their floor for payouts from each business was $300,000 each. Anything below that was deemed not worth their time. Why? Because by 2021, they had discovered the ugly and uncomfortable truth about how ransomware is allowed to work. Companies of this size, they'd found, were more likely to pay up than to risk the embarrassment and disruption of their business and would have the cash on hand to do so. Instead of wasting time arguing over tens of thousands of dollars with thousands of victims, they could simply target the whales and get a higher percentage conversion rate for a higher dollar value. For this reason, Netwalker very quickly made a name for themselves in the world of cybercrime. They were the ransomware company. People wanted to work with them. They had the best affiliates signing up. They were essentially printing money without performing any of the actual crime or legwork themselves. On top of that, they were originally a Russian-only organization, putting them far from the reaches of federal governments in the Western world who would want to arrest them for the billions of dollars in yearly damages. This essentially made them insulated and printing money passively. After all, you could either play in the little leagues for pennies, or you could give Netwalker a big kickback and join the major leagues for the big bucks. This is exactly where Sebastian found himself in April 2020. His training had finished, and he was ready to become a Netwalker, the next step in his criminal career. Very quickly, Sebastian earned himself a reputation as being somewhat of a legend. The Netwalker organization was the cream of the crop. This was the big time. And Sebastian, 
was their most valuable player by far. He was securing ransoms faster than any of the 100 or so other affiliates, gaining massive sums of Bitcoin in the process. He was so successful, in fact, that they convinced him to begin teaching courses of his success on the dark web with classrooms full of aspiring cyber criminals. This guy was like the Michael Jordan of ransomware. During one year of being an affiliate with Networker, Sebastian secured over half of their entire operational earnings. To put that in a dollar amount, in just one year, he managed to single-handedly extort over $21.5 million, where Networker's entire operational earnings worldwide was $40 million in the same period. But to anyone outside of Sebastian's world, nothing in this year changed at all. He wasn't making the same mistakes as many petty criminals who quickly come into vast wealth. There were no sports cars, Gucci flip-flops, Louis Vuitton bags or Richard Mill watches, no big houses, no models and no private jet pictures on Instagram. He was still driving his mundane car, living in his modest suburban house. It seemed as if he was treating the criminal enterprise as a high score on a Pac-Man machine, simply trying to reach the highest number he could with no impulse to quit while ahead or splash the incredible sums of stolen wealth. In fact, if it wasn't for the simple mechanics of how crime works, Sebastian may never have been caught due to how careful he was. But this is real life, and Sebastian was about to find out just how hard that statement hits. Let's look at it like this. If you're a small time nobody using your own software and stealing a few dollars here and there, sure, you're not in the big leagues, but you also have a singular point of failure, and that is you, yourself. If you were to do everything perfectly, you would likely remain completely insulated for your entire career. But when working as essentially a franchised element of an organization like Netwalker, you are sitting atop a house of cards during a shitstorm. You could do everything perfectly, but one slip up from anybody else in the whole organization, and you could be the one paying the price. Not just that, but everything you do is now amplified. You're earning huge sums of money, but you're also causing even larger sums of damages. You're shutting down oil companies, which is causing queues at the pumps and increased prices. You're shutting down hospitals for sick kids. You're shutting down law firms and putting stress on the legal system. You are part of a group that has a brand name who are being pointed at by the most powerful federal agencies on the planet. And unlike the owners of that brand name who are hiding in Russia, Sebastian was in Canada, a stone's throw away from a federal prison cell. And little did he know, the cards beneath him were about to fall. While sleeping, Sebastian's life was about to change forever. You see, the US government had found the weak link, and it was ironically the stick that all ransomware operators were using to persuade their victims to pay up. That stick, of course, was the punishment blog operated by Netwalker, the website hosted on the dark web that acted as a treasure trove of data from those who decided not to negotiate with the hackers. A website that in a single 12 month period represented billions of dollars in damages with the information that they'd posted. But even dark websites have to be hosted somewhere. And it just so happened that the FBI had discovered exactly where. A Bulgarian server, which was now scheduled to be taken down during a multifaceted operation that would see Sebastian in cuffs. And the blog changed to a familiar site for dark websites, a logo of the FBI and a notice of seizure. On January 27th, 2021, this is exactly what happened. The Netwalker blog redirected to an FBI notice, and once that rock was lifted, the Netwalker operators scattered in every direction, their 100 or so affiliate members along with them. But right there, with a the bright light shining on him, was the single most valuable member of the organization and the only one remaining to face the consequences. Royal Canadian Mounted Police took him into custody, searching his home in the process. Within minutes, they knew they had the right man. Hundreds of thousands of dollars hidden across the house, keys to safety deposit boxes with hundreds of thousands of dollars across multiple boxes, and of course, dozens of laptops, computers, and Bitcoin wallets containing over 790 Bitcoin, valued at the time of seizure at around 30 million Canadian dollars. At this point, the RCMP began their investigation with an emphasis on finding Sebastian's Canadian victims and tracing his impact back to those attacks. And you know what they found? Well, they found that most of the companies that had been extorted for sometimes millions of dollars 
refuse to help the investigation. Some of them outright refused to acknowledge any crime had been committed or that they were even hacked at all. Why? Well, this goes back to why ransomware can exist as a concept. To use a crude analogy, this is why you don't negotiate with terrorists. If every single time a ransomware attack happened, the company or the individual refused to pay, ransomware would cease to exist as it then wouldn't be profitable to engage in, which would leave the criminals to find other things to do with their time that actually paid for that effort. The only way ransomware can exist is because somebody paid. At that point, it became a business worth pursuing, which made it grow, which is a self-fulfilling prophecy. What you discover as you deep dive into the murky waters of ransomware though, is that most companies of a certain size will simply pay the ransom to avoid embarrassment, regulatory repercussions, loss of trust from customers or partners, and potential for larger damages. The difference between paying a $300,000 ransom or rebuilding your system without adequate backups could easily cost tens of millions of dollars in finances alone, let alone the damage to your business reputation, which may never recover. And regardless of whether they pay or not, many businesses do not wish to acknowledge that they were ever the victim of an attack in the first place, even if it means getting restitution in the process. Which makes the statistics of reported ransomware attacks thought to be only a fraction of those that exist, with some experts claiming around 95% simply go unreported. So, with all that in mind, what became of Netwalker and Sebastian in the end? After the seizure, Netwalker ceased operation, although since the masterminds of the operation were never caught, it's unlikely that they're gone for good. As for Sebastian, he cooperated with Canadian authorities, telling them everything he knew about how the ransomware world works, but refusing to give up any names or members of his organisation. He pled guilty to extortion and other crimes, being sentenced to seven years in prison during the Canadian trial. The United States had other plans, however. They extradited him to Florida, where the FBI task force had been situated, and proceeded to charge him again with the same crimes, which he also pleaded guilty to. The lawyers agreed to a 13 to 14 year sentence, which was the lowest they could go due to sentencing guidelines. The judge, however, did not agree. Instead, he compared Sebastian to a modern day Jesse James, using a computer instead of a gun to rob banks. Pointing out the incredible damage he caused, as well as the lack of mitigating circumstances surrounding his reasons to commit such crimes. After all, there was no discernible reason as to why he turned to a life of crime. He grew up normally, he was educated, parents were loving, money was never tight, jobs were never scarce, he was never lonely, he didn't use the money to live lavishly or anything like that, and there was no end in sight. It seemed like he did it all just to see if he could, which played a factor when the judge sentenced him to the maximum for the crimes, which was 20 years in federal custody. And that is the takedown of Netwalker's Sebastian Vachon de Jonde, the best Netwalker, but only 1% of the affiliate operation. A single person out of over 100, and never the mastermind. A man who was responsible for over $21.5 million of ransoms within a single year, who single-handedly infiltrated over 100 businesses across the United States and Canada, causing hundreds of millions, potentially even billions of dollars in damages for those who needed to rebuild in the aftermath of their refusal to pay. And yet, hundreds of his students and those who recruited him are still out there, committing crimes we never see, that are never reported, and yet cost all of society all the same. In the final confession of Sebastian, he admitted that in the weeks leading up to his arrest, he was helping Netwalker to create a new, bigger, and better version of the ransomware. Meaning, if they're not already back, when they are, it could be worse than ever.